You got a new car, you got a new house, new clothes, new makeup, new workout equipment. You got what you wanted, you got what you wanted, and it's clear Christmas is over and the new year has begun. Americans tend to direct their focus on the hopes of routine for the year. Resolutions are made to better our lives. We want to put the past year behind us and focus on the new and the unknown set before us. We want to know what God's will is constantly in the good times and in the bad. What did 2016 look like for you? Was it good? Was it bad? Did you get a good night's rest or a dark night's of the soul? Whatever the case, another year is written in history. A wise man once said, I perceive what God does, he does forever. God is sovereign throughout our lives with each new year. But a question arises, even though we put the old year behind us, what will we do when the new year comes with new trials and new troubles? How do we deal with the old trials that come our way? How do we handle it as the body of Christ? Our theme for the year is walking in the right paths. <coughs> we know that walking in the right paths is on the old path with God. But walking on that old path does not mean walking in the old self. What Amen. self communicates is that it is who we are in sin. It is our sinful nature. And how we make decisions. How we make decisions attempts, uh, um, attempts uh, helps us better our lives. We may struggle making New Year's resolutions, keeping them up. We want, we want them to support how we distinguish ourselves from others. We may not get thrown into the crisis of decisions, but if we do, we want a new starting point bad. The Colossian believers had their own identity crisis of themselves. They were coming under attack not only from external philosophy, but also internal uncertainty that pulled the church apart. This brings us to our passage today in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 17. If you don't have a Bible, if uh, you don't have a Bible today, I wish to say that we could have it on the screen, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the version that I'm using is uh, English Standard Version. So if you have phones, uh, you can use your Bible app with that. Again, the passage is Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Paul wrote to the Colossians when he was first imprisoned in 62 AD. Colossae was a small town in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, that was 100 miles east of Ephesus. It was home to mostly Gentiles and some Jews. 
At the time Paul wrote to the Colossian church, they were dealing with a philosophy called asceticism that promoted intense psychological and physical discipline. This caused to be unsure of what God's what was good in God's sight and divided the church into factions. While the church was dealing with asceticism, different Jewish groups also threatened the church's, the church's unity. Paul wrote to the Colossians to warn them not to go back to their old ways with these ascetic ideals. Rather than tell them to embrace the discipline that asceticism advertised, he argues that the foundation is misguided and their identity rests in Christ. He begins in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not only the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is with you, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul argues in support of Christianity that asceticism would get them nowhere. Paul has his own argument against the ascetic philosophers, but also a message for the Colossian believers. With Paul stating, if then you have been raised with Christ, he addresses the Colossians as assumed believers, as Christians. This is proven from chapter uh, 2, verse 12. The action of being raised with Christ is observed in baptism. Paul says that the believer is buried with Christ in baptism, and where they were also raised with him, up with him through faith in the power and working of God. He raised Christ from the dead. But baptism in itself is not saving. When a Christian dedicates their life in baptism, they are symbolically taking part from what Christ's burial and his resurrection out of the water. And if you haven't been baptized, I strongly urge you to do so. Not because it's a promise of salvation, but as your personal dedication to Christ. Now, as Paul addresses the Colossians, he's assuming that they are, in fact, believers. This is, not a, this is not of uncertainty, but out of serious certainty. The Colossian believers are to be active in their salvation. He says, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The way Paul addresses the Colossians here could also be taken as, Keep seeking the things that are above. This may seem like a vague statement, how are we to seek the things that are above? We can't see them. They don't seem as concrete as the podium that I have in front of me or the chair that you're sitting in. But in fact, there is, they are concrete. They are reality because Christ is reality. Paul views believers' relationship with Christ as an already happened, but not a culminated relationship. <clears throat> it's like when you were a kid and went to a pen pal. You never met them, but you kept on writing to them. And one day you hoped that you would be able to see them again. We have that personal wish for Christ, that we will see him again. Paul says that Christ is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. This is not only a picture of authority, but it also gives an eschatological picture of when believers will go to heaven. Paul repeats himself again in verse 2. The Colossian believers are to set their minds on the things that are above. This is a challenge to asceticism. Paul tells the Colossian believers to set their minds on the things that are above, rather than focus on the physical and psychological discipline that asceticism set and on the things of earth. What Paul doesn't want to say is, set aside your daily lives and the daydream and daydream about what's in heaven. No, Paul wants Christ's death and resurrection to encourage Christians to live for the better. You have died marks this death to sin. It doesn't 
it doesn't communicate a physical death, but the death to sin is already a past action from Christ's death and resurrection. Paul stresses that they still have life. More so, their life is hidden with Christ and God. This is a profound mystery that the Bible communicates. Paul just said that Christ is at the right hand of God, and yet our lives are hidden with Christ in Him. Your life matters to God, matters to Christ, so much that He died for you, and He holds you in His heart. This union with Christ not only goes so far as with Christ, but it also marks the relationship that Christ has with the Holy Trinity. For Christ is found in God, and we are also found in the Trinity. Although, we are still human. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Christ are interworking in our lives. This is the most intimate and true relationship there is. Paul guarantees that the caution believers the relationship of Christ will be fulfilled. Paul draw, draws off of the already not yet relationship we have with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. We will be with him and encounter him in the glorious return. And he comes back. But, I don't want to lose you in your daydreams about the heavens. Paul doesn't either. He tells his readers that the things that are earthly, that are sinful, Paul uses the list to explain what is earthly. They were characteristics of his writings. He uses the list in the passage to refute the ascetic philosophers at the time. He says in verse 5, Put to death what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And having put on the new self, which is being renewed at the knowledge of the image of the Creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and in all. Put to death demonstrates the seriousness of getting rid of the earthly things from one's life. It communicates that the old, the old self has no part in what God, what God has done and that we are called to be holy. He lists the sexual sins first. Sexual immorality was common in the first century, Gentile world. With Colossae being home to many Gentiles, the church had many young Christians who were not mature and still struggling putting off the, the, their sins that were culturally accepted. Impurity was attributed with sexual morality as well. They dealt with morality. Passion was used to refer to shameful passion and sexual excessiveness in Christian writings. An evil desire is known as strong sexual desire. Unlike asceticism's way of dealing with sexual sin, Paul emphasized putting to death the earthly things in Christ. This condition by setting their minds on the heavenly things. Setting your minds on the, heav on the heavenly things shapes your reality. Christ has the power to deliver one from one's sin. It's not from simple self-restraint or self-discipline, but it involves Christ as the ultimate bearer of our sin. That lets our wish grow with Him. Paul letters that the earthly things attract God's wrath. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Again, Paul believes that Christ's coming was imminent, which would bring judgment on the sons of disobedience, sinners, that demanded urgency in what the Colossians were doing at the time. He says, In these two you once walked, 
calling your mind a former state when you were living in them. But in contrast, he says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Paul continues with these sinful vices that the Colossian believers were caught in. Anger promotes an emotional response. It's a natural emotion. But still, being sinful, it gives way to wrath. And wrath gives way to malice, wanting to hurt someone. Slander is gossip, where we put down one another. An obscene talk might refer to swearing. It doesn't refer to swearing that we have today because it's, cult it's culturally susceptible. But, nonetheless, uh, swearing should be included. Malice is spiked from this blasphemy is considered slander, both to God and men. The command is to no longer lie to one another, promotes unity. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self. Against the philosophers. Also, putting on and off clothes was a common illustration in the ancient world, where Paul says, put off these old self devices and put on the new. The old self is discarded like an old raggedy clothes, and the new self is put on as a child of God. In contrast to the old self being identified with the other things, the new self is acknowledged with the heavenly things. The new, the new self is in communion with Christ. It is constantly being renewed in view of Christ as humanity is created. In place of the old self, the new self has new life in fellowship with Christ. Previous identities are discarded because the identity in Christ outshines them. Paul again lists here, there is no Greek or Jew. Circumcise and uncircumcise. Barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. Paul affirms Christ crosses all boundaries and social barriers. Paul did not let him miss anyone when he list them. In each one of these, the old self could be identified as a former walk of life. Jew refers to the Jewish people where they were focused on the covenant with God and also the law. Greek refers to the entire Roman Empire and those passed before because of Alexander the Great's conquest. Circumcised and uncircumcised also distinguish between a Jew and a Gentile because the Jews focused on circumcision as a saving fact in God. Paul disagrees with that though in Galatians. Barbarian is a general term that refers to anyone who is not influenced in the Greek language. Mostly we think of these as the Huns who invaded Rome and conquered it. Scythian was uh, uh, part of barbarian. They were considered a low class of the Roman Empire that was looked down upon as murderers and thieves. Josephus said they were a little bit better than wild beasts. Now, I kind of want to pause for that for a moment, because even, even so, where Paul says that barbarians and Scythians are in Christ, that marks that anyone can be delivered from sin. Okay. Slave and free persons were also considered by Paul not to be distinct from each other. This list proves that the old life, no matter what state it's in, Christ abolishes the barrier of sin. Where Paul concludes this list, he says, For Christ is all and in all. And that shut me up a little bit because for Christ is all. Christ is inside of us and in all. He takes part of our being and he shapes our reality. We don't need to be distracted by it. So Paul, in his explanation of the old self, brings focus to the new self. He says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, as God's chosen ones out of salvation, holy and beloved, compassion, 
kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another in love, and if one has complained against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Paul calls the Colossian believers already holy, set apart by God from sin, and beloved by Christ, because they believed. With this comes another list. Paul says for them to put on compassionate hearts, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing takes up the most troubling times, and if one is a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Forgiving is the constant action which Christ, which the Christian does. Although it's not easy, we are called to forgive those who hurt or harm us. Forgiveness comes with the power of Christ, or else we would be vulnerable to the old self and Satan's attacks. And in life, we may, not, we may not always put on the new self. And with the new year, this, ser this sermon serves as a, as a reminder to do so. To put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Compassion reaches out to others, also with kindness. Humility communicates. Humility and meekness communicate that you are submissive, not only to Christ, but encourage a believer by listening to them. Patience also does this. Bearing one another in love. And if one is complaining each other, another forgiving each other. We don't know exactly what the Colossian believers struggled with, but it seems to me that they did have a hard time forgiving each other, one another in the church. And as the body of Christ, we are called to forgive, as he has forgiven us. Paul concludes this section. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do and Lord or do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God our Father through him. Paul stresses, above all these, love binds everything real in perfect harmony in the new self. Out of putting off the old sinful vices and putting on the things of Christ, Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. This is the source of tranquility and comfort. No doubt this was already the state of peace that Christ had given at the cross in the resurrection. The cup the confidence and calmness of the Colossian believers was a reflection of victory and reconciliation. Paul refers to them as one body, already found in Christ. But the same applies to the church now, seen as the universal body. As an afterthought, Paul tags at the end of the sentence, and be thankful. He also goes in another list of church life. Psalms were used to refer to the Old Testament, where they would use as hymns. Also in the first century they used hymns, created by themselves for worship. Paul says that this worship should be done in thankfulness to God. Paul sums up what the purpose of this worship should be and reflect. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving Thanks to the Father through him. Paul says elsewhere in Romans 1 through 2, do, do this as your spiritual act of worship, marking that who we are as Christians, with Christ indwelled in us, whatever we do is worship to God if we dedicate it to him. Colossians 3, 1 through 17 conveys that Paul's overall message is that the Colossians are to be in Christ and are called to be active in their salvation. 
This shows how the Colossian believers were to actually live in putting off the earthly things. They are now called holy ones. And this is things that were of God in contrast with the things of earth. Thus as Christians, Paul affirms that their identity is no longer in ethnicity or practice, but in Christ as Christians. And seeing the things above and putting on the new self, we stay on the right path. Whatever you set out to do in the new year, Christ is in you to strengthen you. Be encouraged that he is there to help you whenever you need it. The problems of yesterday are in the past, but maybe they can't be forgotten. <coughs> maybe, they, maybe they've been brought into the new year. These problems have a way of causing division and faction between people in the church, maybe at work, or maybe in the home. Parts of the old stuff still exist inside us because of our sinful nature. But as Christians, we are called to put off the old self and put on the new. In doing so, we are seeking to please Christ. Revelation paints the glorious picture of being of when we will be reunited with Christ. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was <clears throat> no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither, neither there will be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. And he, Christ, who is seated on the throne, said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this new year. I thank you that since you've died on the cross and resurrected from us, that you are making us new as people, that we can be able to say, we are putting off the old and putting on the new. I pray that you be with each one of us as the new year comes, whatever comes our way, I ask that you be with us and that you take care of us. I ask that if they do encounter anger, malice, hatred, lying, stealing, that they do forsake it.